and welcome to episode 7 of the Bechdel Theatre Podcast. I'm Pippa. And I'm Beth. And, and we're your hosts. This week, Beth went to chat to Tutku Barbaros, who recently published an article in response to the play Angel at the Arcola Theatre. Uh, just to give you some context, Angel is a one-woman show based on the life of Kurdish law student and alleged killer of a hundred ISIS soldiers. The play, however, was written by a white British man, Henry Naylor, and starring a white Russian actor, Avital Lavova. I really recommend you head over to the Tongue website to read um, Tuku's fantastic review slash response, and that is the Tongue spelt T-U-N-G. Have a read of that. And then press play again here because um, Beth's got a fantastic interview with Tutku coming right up. Hello, welcome. Thanks. Hi, Tuts. Uh, we're in my living room having a quick interview. It probably won't be quick, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yes. Hello. I'm Toots. Um, and I um, am part of a theatre company, Plunge Theatre, which I set up with um, Isabella Mineska and Lily Pollard. We all went to uni together. And we were part of a company before that. And then in that first year since we graduated, I had these really like uniquely feminine experiences, which were like as our position, as the jobs that we're doing and stuff. And um, so, yeah, we set up a feminist theatre company. We're making work together. And so that's been sort of the bulk of what I've been doing and devising with them. And then outside of that, I direct and I write. And I've just finished Royal Court Writers Programme. And I'm working on something there. Well, not there, but for them. Um, and, yeah, so, yeah, so that's me. And then, I, and then I write for a few online platforms and do sort of music journalism and theatre critic stuff. Cool. You're an all-rounder. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Amazing. Where did you go to uni? Sussex. Amazing. Yeah, I went to Sussex. We're from Brighton, did you know that? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, we all, yeah, we all went to Sussex and did, like, this amazing course, which was... We did English Lit and Drama, so you had the English, which was very, like, sort of historical and literary and academic, and then the drama course was, like, the total opposite. It was, like, looking at Karen Finley, like, shoving cool jets up her ass kind of thing. <laughs> So it's so like everything that we do has always had that that flavour of being like, on the one hand, like about the message, but like how can you release it in the most like absurd and like and and strange and different and like delineated way and make it funny as well. Funny is key to us. Yes. Um. So yeah. So I've been doing a lot of work with them. Those are my girls, and uh, yeah, and then separately we all do our own bits and pieces as well. Doing lots of writing. Yes, exactly. So the reason we wanted to get you on the podcast today is um, because of this article that you wrote about the show Angel at the Arcola. Yeah. Um, so you went in to review this show, mm -hmm. and you've written an article on the Tongue website. Yeah. And it went viral. Yeah. Big it up was the all tongue, over Twitter. Great people. Yeah. What, What's the tongue? The tongue is an online arts and culture magazine. It's fairly new, but it's really, really good. They give, I mean, obviously for me, like they're amazing because they just gave me this platform to sort of say what I need to say. And the editors there are really, really encouraging and really good people. And they have like a culture calendar they receive, that they send out, sorry, every week, which is really like on point about what you should be going to. It's really good. It's just not like, it's more fun than other sort of arts and culture websites. So, yeah. yeah. I've been doing some writing for them for a while and then sent me along to Angel and so what made you go along to Angel what were you thinking when you went so Angel was I already knew that Angel was happening um I'd seen it released on the sort of Arcola mail out a couple of months before and had already looked into the casting and sort of had to think about what it was and I'd already tweeted the Arcola um because I found it problematic from the off obviously that they hadn't cast a Middle Eastern woman um, I'm Turkish, I've always been very drawn to the Arcola because of the work that they create there, so I always very keenly like look, look at what's going on there kind of thing, and uh, saw that they hadn't cast it appropriately, sent them a tweet, it was ignored. So then I just, I think for the last like couple of years I've made this quite active decision to just be really uh, focused on where I'm spending my money and where I'm going and where, where I'm showing my solidarity, so I was like, I'm not going to go to that, and a few 
people have been like, have you heard about this? Do you want to go to it? And I've been like, I'm not giving it, I'm not going to go. I'm just not going to go. Yeah. And then Tongue got in touch and said, we've actually been sent some tickets for it, so would you like to go? And so, yeah, I was like, this is actually going to be a really good opportunity for me to see what it is, but also be able to sort of critically reflect, reflect on it. Because I think I knew... Because I've been to see stuff before where it's been wrongly cast but very very well done which like not well done in terms of the casting but like it's beautiful or it it's or the actors are great or whatever and so then that gives you like a, a nuanced discussion about it being good isn't enough of a justification like that's yeah. never the problem um so I knew that when I went in that I was going to have this issue and I, I knew that I was always going to write about the casting but I was also willing you know to see what the crack was going to be like, I wanted to... Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting position that you get put in as someone that gets invited to stuff, because we sometimes do. Yeah. That thing of, like, I choose where I spend my money, I'm not going to give, give like, funds to this show. Yeah. But when you're given an opportunity to sit there and kind of... Reflect on it. Yeah, you know, that's what they're asking you to do by giving you a ticket. Exactly. They're not saying, come in and praise us and promote us. Exactly. They're saying, what do you think of our show? Exactly, exactly. Um, so it's great. Yeah, it's it was a really... Chance. I saw it straight away for what it was. Like, this is an opportunity for you to have a voice that is never... Like, I, you know, I don't... I mean, I feel, like, so singular a lot of time in the industry because of, like, where I'm from and what my situation is and the, my, my circle of people I can really relate to has got bigger and bigger over the last couple of years, even, like, the last two weeks since, like, publishing the article. It's been amazing. But, I mean... It, it just felt like I know that there are people out here that will need that will want to read this stance on it, so I need to I need to do that. So I felt like a responsibility. Yeah, and one that kind of you took with both hands. And yes, yes. It, like you've had the article's amazing. Oh man, that first draft I was just like so angry. <laughs> <laughs> I, we were like we both like I went with my friend and we he's Iranian. I sort of mentioned him in the article, but we were like like almost shaking because you know when you're like. I'm trying so hard to comprehend like all of these different things because there is, there is, there's all the critical stuff. There's all the ac academic stuff. And that is really, really important. And I think we should never lose sight of that. But there's also the fact that we are sitting there as two people from those backgrounds made to feel like completely, completely alien in a story that's meant to be about us. And the thing is, is that like that really hurts and it's really damaging and it's and like I know a lot of people who dip in and out of the industry because who who are from from different ethnic backgrounds because they can't take the pain of it all the time of always being reminded that like whatever you're pitching whatever you're selling it's either seen as incredibly niche or you're not adequate enough or you're too brown or not brown enough and I think there's always there's a real pain there and I think sitting there as like a director and he's an actor and knowing also that like we get work because of it or rejected from work because of it and knowing that like, you're wading all those things all the time. So it was quite painful, like, and it took a lot of energy to, like, come at it very critically. So I had, to, I had to redraft it quite a few times. Well, it's critical, but, like, so for those of you who don't know, for listeners who don't know, the play Angel is about a Kurdish woman um, who was fighting in Syria and the play is written and directed by white people, men, yeah, and has a white woman yeah, it's in the main role, team. yeah, um, and a white woman, Russian woman, yeah, in the main role, um, and the way you've written about it, it's almost like the reader is sitting in the theatre with you, thank you, going through the experience with you, and the fact that it's not a hundred percent like distance academic criticism, mm -hmm. and it acknowledges the emotions that you were going through mm, without mm, just mm. being a splurge of emotion yeah, yeah, yeah. is amazing because it's it's putting the reader in a position of of this is how you're feeling and that's what's important when you go in the theatre is your emotional response. That's what the directors go out yeah. you know, go out to get yeah, and exactly, they've obviously we, got the complete wrong emotional exactly, response. Exactly. Like I think we go to the theatre to to think and feel and, and be inspired and be touched. And I think when you're in a situation that it's it's a story that feels like it in some way belongs to you, it's really painful to have that sort of ripped out of your own narrative. And, you know, I talk about that, how, like, you know, we do get othered out of our own stories all the time and it couldn't have been any less appropriate that in a play, you know, in in Dalston, which is, like, the most densely populated Kurdish area in London, and 
no one was there. Like, we weren't there. Like, no one was there. We're sitting there, like, a, like so obvious. Even in terms of age range, like, we were, like, much younger than everyone else. Um, Which is not what the Arcola aims to do. Well, it begs that question of, like, who is this for? Like, who was this show for? Like, I think that my problem with it is that... I mean, I have lots of problems with it, obviously, and I've written about them. But they... You know, Henry Naylor has said in interviews that it's about giving voice. But who are you giving voice to? They've they've mentioned because I sort of did a lot of research, and you know, various people in Facebook comments have acted like I haven't done research. But I've really looked hard to find, you know, why has he written this piece? What has he done? What's his backstory? And in all the interviews, he just talks about like, oh, um, you know, based on different Syrian women. Which Syrian women mm. weren't they mentioned anyway? Because if you did use them. And they gave you the content of your show, but you haven't mentioned them in your program. That's incredibly problematic to go and harvest truth out of people, and then not and then not give them credit for it. That's completely inappropriate and blatant plagiarism. But he ha he clearly hasn't done that. Like he clearly hasn't. Like there were things in the piece that were like, like there was this thing that I kept on catching on to where he kept on describing, um, all of the descriptions of the men was that they were small. And I found that really funny because I was like, as, you know, as, as a Turkish woman, or like, you, like that kind of like average height Turkish man, Middle Eastern men are quite small. Like, sorry, Middle Eastern men, like some of you are very tall. It's not a problem. It's fine. But like, but like, you know, and, and so that made me laugh because I was a bit like, there's such an emphasis being placed on the fact these men are small. But like a Kurdish woman wouldn't say that. Like, I would never be like he was small. Because they're... Because that's, like, that's the national average height in. is, like... Do you know what I mean? It's, like... And it was one of those really silly things. And, like, stuff like... There were even references to, like, the pistachios being, like, purple on the trees. I was like, well, no, they're not. They're, like, they're a different colour. And like, there was all this stuff that was, like, I feel like you're regurgitating this kind of exoticised, like, I go grocery shopping at Green Lanes, therefore I know what Turkish identity is like, what Kurdish identity is like, what Middle Eastern identity is like. And he doesn't. And there was a lot there that just made me feel like, even if he'd done a lot of research, he'd still gone for his own narrative over it. And there were lots of lines in there. So even the fact that in the, in the biog, in the biog, what's this? The programme, he's like, oh, I stumbled across this story about a Kurdish <laughs> I stumbled woman. across it. <laughs> and even that is like, oh, like... Did you vote? Because also, it's like the most widely reported. Like, you know, this whole thing about Rehanna was like massively in the media mm. when it came out in 2014. So you didn't stumble across anything. It's actually the most like blatant story that's come out. There's been millions of women from these nations. There's so much like rhetoric about how um, women from Muslim nations are oppressed. But actually, like lots of those places have some of the biggest sort of revolutionary bodies of women that have ever existed, they're very, very critical of, of British and American sort of non-governmental organisations and things that have gone in. And so even that was really difficult because it was like he was pitching as like, oh, there was this one revolutionary character in the entire history. And it's just not right. It's just not smart. It's not smart enough. It's really obvious. Yeah, like <laughs> beyond obvious. It's like, and, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's that very like strict narrative. And I mean, even the fact, like I say in the article, like she's, it's meant to be her story, but like so much of the time she's playing men, like she's playing her dad a lot of the time. So it's like, you've used the body of a woman yeah, to say the words of a man and it doesn't feel authentic that they're Middle Eastern men in any way it's at all. Really bizarre. Have there been any other like articles in response to it? I know there's been a lot of responses to your article, which mm. we'll talk about in a minute, but has anyone else brought it up? in their reviews no I've only read good things about it I've only read really really good things about it and um it did really well in Edinburgh but I mean Edinburgh is it would have been maybe one of like what like three plays about the Middle East so the competition is, is like slim anyway yeah um and I remember being in Edinburgh when the Bone Collector was on myself as a performer but I think I never saw it but there's, the, you know, the trilogy of plays is called Arabian Nightmares. That, to me, that, like, that branding is enough to say, is enough of a warning. And I think that to be someone who, like, in his Twitter bio, it's like, loves the Middle East. It's like, but do you love the Middle East? Because you've only written about 
the deepest, darkest, like most negative parts of it, where you could have written something that gave hope or voice or light, but what we've actually got. And obviously, like, uh, you know, to choose to write about something tragic is, you know, writer's prerogative, that's not a thing. But I think if you're using other people's pain as stimulus for your own writing, then you always have to be careful anyway. In particular, if you are a white, middle-class male man who's been extremely privileged yeah. in his both television and theatrical career, um, there's a responsibility there. It there's, just feels very exploitative. It's just people. totally colonial. Like, it's totally colonial. It's like, I'm going out... Discover like, making discoveries. Do you know what I mean? It's like fucking Ugh. Rudyard Kipling. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm going out here... I've, I feel close to these people because I've lived amongst them and I can write this thing now and then I can come back and bring it to the UK and sit it very comfortably in what will be a very white audience and they will appreciate it. And the assumption that um, in the UK you're going to get a white audience, like, that's bizarre. And also, which was in to me... <laughs> yeah, well, no, but this is what was so interesting about it was that... I, what I previously loved about the Arcola is that I go and see stuff and I look around the room and it is diverse and there's people of different ages, there's people of different ethnicities, it feels, it feels diverse and they've done a lot of work to make the building more diverse in terms of like um, being accessible and, and so it's always felt like this, this hub and when I was looking around at this audience and I was like, hmm, there's none of the people that I usually see here which made me feel like I'm not the only person that feels that this is problematic. Because otherwise... Like, for example, I went to see um, Scenes from 68 Years. That was brilliant. Gorgeous production. Loved it. By Hannah Callow. Saw that. And it was packed. And I was sat next to, like, 20 Free Palestine activists. Do you know what I mean? It felt like, okay, everyone is here and they've drawn to this. So there was already something about the energy in the room. That piece did not make any assumptions about its audience. Not at all. And it, and it played... It didn't... Because I think for me, like, what I found really interesting, and I think it's something that I've noticed much more post-Brexit, but it's something that I've always been aware of, is that there are very strong narratives about what being Muslim and what being Muslim heritage means. And there always have been, and we've always been aware of that, you know, because we're living in this sort of, like, post... Like, like all of our media is guard geared towards talking about there's various conflicts since, you know, certain things have happened in history. But I've found that, like... Like, for example, when um, when we were doing Private View, a reviewer came and saw the show. So that was the show that you're... Yes, yeah, so this is what I perform in. It's about body image and women, and it's sort of verbatim mixed with devised theatre, and it comes from our perspective, and it's about our imperfections as people. And um, the three of us look very different, um, and Isabella's in the piece is... You know, she's tall and, and blonde and fits like an Aryan standard of beauty. And in the production, we, we play to that. We involve that. You know, she succeeds in being the most beautiful in a sort of like a game of trying to get more perfect. Yeah. And this reviewer came and saw it. And um, she wrote... And like, it would have been interesting because, retrospectively, she's in the position that I feel like I was in seeing Angel. But she came and saw it. And then in her review, she commented, she said, you know, I'm watching three white women express their white privilege talking about body image standards and that was like a huge huge moment for me yeah. in my career like a huge I think every from that point on things sort of would have changed in terms of because I think for me like I've always seen myself as a POC like I always have mm -hmm. I don't it doesn't mean to like and in you know in the broad sense and I think that there's been language around that which has been really difficult to to navigate for a really long time because people will always go like, oh what so you think you're black and it's like no like that's not what I'm saying I'm saying that I have like a different heritage background I come from a different language I come from you know like my parents experiences are very different to that of like um what a white woman my age is I've had different experiences that have been informed by that but also I am white passing and that's something that I'm really really aware of and and that article was like, oh shit, you're going to have to fight for your own visibility, Toots. Because at the moment, the narrative around... Did they not see your name in the programme? I mean, also Isabella Malevska. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But like, no, like they just obviously had come in with like this agenda. And I really had that in mind when I went to see Angel. Cause I was they like, hadn't done the research that you did when you went to see Angel. No, of course not. And, it, and that was, and it was one of these things that was like, 
but it made me aware that there's there's an onus now on sort of people with Muslim heritage. Whether or not you're practicing Muslim is a very different thing because I think you know, I think that's a like I've had a lot of conversations where people have been like, oh, you know, the thing about Islam is blah blah blah, and then they say loads of like really negative stuff, and then they look at me and they see the like panic in my eyes, and then they're like, oh, sorry, where are you from? And it's like, yeah, I'm Turkish, and I go, oh right, so you're not like a proper Muslim and to me like that is the most frightening thing this happens to me like so many times but to me that's frightening because all you're saying in that statement is like I feel confident belittling an entire race or religion because I feel like you're gonna back me up whereas actually if you care about equality and you care about people then you should never be saying this stuff you should all you should you should be asking people's opinion and also the thing is is that like I don't hear white people being like, oh, you're not a proper Christian. Well, yeah, but like, you still like, when you go to a wedding, you're walking each other up and down the aisle and like doing like your lines about like, till death us do part and all that, like deeply ingrained, like patriarchy and misogyny that's part of that. Oh, don't get me started on that. <laughs> but, but that's cool because you're just like, oh, it's your cultural norm. Whereas when I turn around and say like, yeah, right, cool, you're right. I'm not like a practicing Muslim, but like, it's a huge part of my life. It's a huge part of the cultural norm of where I'm from. You know, like, when I go home to Cyprus, I am in a situation where I'm hearing, like, the call to prayer five times a day. Like, I feel, like, incredibly close to that. And there are, you know... I shouldn't have to justify it. I shouldn't have to be, like, I'm Muslim in these ways and not Muslim in other ways. Because I don't... I've never sat down and said to, like, a white person, in what ways are you Christian, in what ways are you not? And there's that scary um, moment where people are saying oh you're not like a proper muslim like now we can be islamophobic around you exactly like, what are people like, saying when they think everyone around them exactly is? what are white people saying when they think everyone around them is white with christian heritage? exactly it's like literally who else are you talking to that's yeah. like yeah that's fine and i think it's one of those things where it's like people are putting the words in your mouth all the time and i and i remember responding to that excellent review and being like you know it's not your place to decide where I'm from. If I see myself as a POC, it's not for you to say that I'm not. But she, and she never responded, and and they never responded. So that was like kind of like my first taste of like you know you say something and then people don't come back to you. Mm. Um, and I had it in mind with Angel, and I thought about it a lot since as a creative and about the ways in which you know I have to push myself forward and and have that responsibility because also there are lots of people who have Muslim heritage who are very, very criti critical of those... Like, I am too, of course I am. Like, there's there's loads. There's there's loads to be critical about. And there are a lot of practising Muslims who criticise people from Muslim heritage of saying, well, you're not Muslim. Because exactly, Muslim. exactly. But, I mean, I think the point is that when people try to, like, whitewash me, and people do do it all the time, mm -hmm. I'll be like, well, no, actually, because, like, my younger brother gets routine checked when he's out in his car... Young, like, like double the amount mm -hmm. of times that like a white kid would. Like, every fucking time I go to the airport, it's like because as soon as they see my name down on paper, it's like take off a shoes, do this. I have to go through that rigmarole. I have to experience boys in clubs thinking it's cool to touch my hair and call me Habibi and like us and say like weird things, not weird, like just really misguided things. Mm -hmm. But it's like that experience isn't the same. Mm -hmm. For everyone else, and that for me had always been a given because I've always moved in this big diverse circle, and it's always been that we've always been able to like like I grew up in London, like we're bouncing off each other all the time. I didn't feel this need to be like this is who I am because it was constantly accepted. But then you enter the industry, and you do find yourself in a situation all the time where you're surrounded by loads of white creatives, and they're talking for you and at you. And you kind of do have to go, like, no, not me. Because otherwise, you get yourself in a position of assimilating. Mm. Um, and then that quite often then turns into sort of diluting your opinion and not being true to yourself. And that's where sort of... And I think all of this really came into play when I was writing a piece for Angel. Because I was like, if you never get another opportunity to say this, you need to sort of get it all down now. And in terms of the response to it, it sort of really confirmed my belief in writing it because 
So the responses to it has been nothing from the Arcola, right? Nothing. Like, nothing. And to me, that's that's so telling. That's... that's. How many weeks has it been since you wrote the article? Um, oh, it was published on September 15th. Yeah. And it is now, what, October the 4th? 4th. So it's nearly a month, and they haven't... It is a month, and they haven't said anything. And I'd already... Like, Not a word. And the run's nearly over of Angel. Yeah. Um, but so... when you Google it... Angel reviews Arcola. It's in like the top few that come up. And when you look on the Arcola's website, it's uh, we like diversity is the top kind of thing they're interested in promoting. It says like we believe diversity makes for better art and more flourishing art scene. Um, we should re- provide free rehearsal space to emerging ethnically diverse artists. But what about when they want to actually get on the stage? Free rehearsal space, cool. Yeah, like, exactly, exactly. And for me, it's just absolutely baffling. Like, as a, as a theatre maker myself, I wouldn't fucking dream of doing something without including the appropriate people. Because, like, this is the thing, is that, and, like, a lot of the response I've had... So, on the one hand, it's been, like, incredible. And, and so many women, in particular Middle Eastern women, have come forward... And it's been great, because I'm like, great, where have you been? Like, I haven't, you know, like, now, now we can all be in touch with each other. And, and a lot of people have responded saying, like, I saw it, and I felt this, and I didn't say. And for me, that's, like, the crux of the problem, and, like, the crux of the industry, and where we're at at the moment. Because, you know, like, one guy, right? <laughs> this is actually, like... And this is jokes. Like, this is funny to me. Like, he, I put it in um, a Playwright, Playwriting UK, which is a Facebook group, and my man, like replied in the comments and all he all he put in the comments was he'd copied and pasted every single positive review that the play has yes. had and you know when it's like what does that achieve what is that saying is that like so what so and on that logic right there is then history doesn't progress at all if that's the logic that you're going for then we don't do it then then we might as well you know and all never change anything he was quoting were white as well so it's like oh white people love white work that is um making use colonial show me show me show me the the, surprise white people show me the ethnically diverse creatives that were viewing shows in edinburgh show me show me all those journalists and 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 show me how many of them were women show me how many of them aren't also secretly trying to get work from people like henry Mm. naylor which is also a big fucking problem there's a huge tension between like with so much of theater reviewing going to blogging it's great because you can get you know more kind of political voices you can get in theory more diverse voices but you also get the tension between people who are like yourself performers as well as yeah exactly and and like us i guess as well of course and that is the reason why i don't regard myself as a theater critic because if i'm writing about a production it's usually because i really love it and i want Mm. to give it the airtime. but in terms of what i write about you know like you like i've written i was like doing some writing for mtv last year and like all sorts of different pieces but i tend to write about you know forms of hip-hop like netflix series Mm. like stuff like that that i think is bringing something new to the vernacular. So it's, it's, it's always about like specific things. And I'm not someone who's going and seeing loads of theatre all the time and, and, and critiquing it. Because also as someone who makes it... It's difficult. It's difficult. And also I don't believe in like quantifying art as good or bad. But I do believe in quantifying as ethically responsible yes. and appropriate and well done. And I think that, you know, people that wanted to criticise what I wrote, you know someone responded being like, but, you know, what's... Like, you're trying to censor art. Well, actually, this is bullshit. This is actual bullshit. Because the thing is, art... Yeah, like, art in some ways is, like, floaty and beautiful and ephemeral and we can do amazing things with it. But also, it's, like, the most staunchly used form of propaganda that we have. You know, like, Nazi Germany thrived on creating anti-black art and it was Mm. art. And And I think that... You know, like, when trolls are really getting at me about, like, what art is and being an artist, I always just respond, like, Hitler was an artist. Yeah. And, like, it's always my line. And, like, it always pops up. But it's, like... But I just think that justifying things as art is actually, at the moment, a euphemism for, like, ripping people's stories away from them and saying we have the right to create. And the thing is, is I'm not arguing Henry Naylor's right to write that story because I write and, and many people write. And, like, you know, I write about if I want to write about unicorns or whatever, 
then that's that's what writing is like you're creating and that is the the beauty of writers sometimes that they can voice an experience and articulate an experience where others might not where you know where the people actually experiencing them aren't going to go like you know my ha my home's been like blown away by a tornado i don't have time to write a play about it but hey like you rock on if you want to and then you can bring something like a new slant to that and and create something but if you're not going to do it with the people in mind that you've done it then who are you doing it for and why are you doing it and why should you be allowed to do it when those people are all around you or people have who have a closer proximity to that experience yeah, exactly. all around you like they may not have been able to work with the Kurdish woman who Angel is about um but they can work with but for me it's about fear like I don't I think it's about ignorance and I think it's about fear because you know, someone like Henry Naylor is is writing from a position of like extreme privilege and probably doesn't get called out that much. Doesn't get and hasn't been called out that much. So if you invite someone into the room who's Middle Eastern, then there's going to be a tension about your work. And there, and there are things in that production that I know that you know someone would have gone. I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure about that. Maybe you should think about this. And it's that fear of being questioned. And if art's not there to ask questions and to interrogate then it's only there to sort of regurgitate a story. And what's the point? It like, just, what's the point? It's astounding that they didn't even just think, let's hire a dramaturg that is from this part of the world to correct us before we make an arse up ourselves. Genuinely, like... I mean, it baffles me in some sense, but then in other ways I see it all the time. Like, yeah. it's a prevailing part of, like, you know, lots, lots of things we watch. And I think that, you know, with with the case of Angel, there was an opportunity there in particular to talk about the role of women in combating IS and they didn't take it. No. So again, it's what was the play about? They could have talked about, you know, there's so much rhetoric bandied around all the time about how oppressed Islamic women are. But again, ISIS like is attracting the women at the moment. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're enlisting and that's a really interesting and important we need to to think about and i think that to have an, a story which is really inspiring and is really interesting about a woman whether or not it's true but like about a woman who you know takes on isis and does really well in that and then kind of like disappears back into the world of like where did she come from where you know like what's happened there was an opportunity there to do something really interesting to mix it up and that opportunity just wasn't taken and i want to know why and that's my question to henry Naylor, like why did you do this? And their refusal to respond in any way. Um, it, my friend made a really good point, and this is her point, so I'll credit her. But like she, she literally said that it, their power is in their silence, which is true because they're maintaining the status quo. Like I'm, I'm just some like disgruntled blogger. He's travelled the world with this show and got all of these awards. Who am I? Why should he engage with me? And again, it fits back into the rest of it. Why should a middle-class, privileged, white man engage with a Middle Eastern jobbing theatre critic? Like, why should he do... Like, or, or woman, full stop, besides from what I do. Like, why should he talk to me? And I think that's exactly where we're at with it. And, like, their silence is astonishing. And I think the Arcola should actually be ashamed of themselves because if they're going to have the first thing on their website talking about diversity and not even acknowledge the fact that this piece has been written. It's really chilling in how it's changed, like, my perspective on the Arcola, yeah. especially. Yeah, same, for me too. Um, and also the fact that they haven't responded. Because it, um, it, it made me think of the whole print room debacle where they had white people playing Chinese characters. Yeah. But how quickly the print room actually responded to that makes me think... At the time, I was like, you know, their responses are shit. Yeah. But they responded. Yeah. Like, to hear silence yeah. is... I think when I saw your article, I immediately went, oh, look on the Alcoda's Twitter for their response, because they must have responded by now. The article's been up for a few hours. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I could see them tweeting about the show. But there is... And I was just thinking, how... How... The audacity but of just shutting down. They're locked in, isn't it? Like, that's the thing. Like, there's nothing... There's nothing that they can say that will make it right now. Because if they say actually we did loads of research we spoke to loads of middle eastern women then i will just come back with so why didn't you feature that in your program why did you take information from them but not credit them that's wrong 
Um, if they turn around and say, I can write whatever I want, I can do whatever the fuck I like, then that's just like a five year old's argument. And we that can was un- the print room argument, wasn't yeah, it? Exactly. And we can, yeah, exactly. And we can unpick that. If they say it's because, you know, we know each other personally and we all wanted to work together, there's nothing. Like, there's nothing that they can come back with. And therefore, you know, if they just shut up, they can just hope that I'll go away. And the play will continue to flourish. The play will continue to do well. But perceptions will change about what the art cola does. And, you know, I've had some really interesting, really... Because there have been, like, a handful of negative responses. But to give them headspace would be, like, stupid. Because the, the positive response has been so much bigger. Like, in particular, a lot of people got in touch saying, you know, I saw the show in Edinburgh and... I couldn't believe it and I couldn't believe it was doing so well and I've been waiting for someone to write about it and again it's that thing that there's this quote by Audre Lorde which is like your silence will not protect you and it's so true like your silence never protects you and I think that in this industry there's such a culture of like you know sit pretty wait it out like wait till you've got more behind you before you have your say but I think I've got to a point now where I'm like if I don't have my say now, then I'm doing, like, then I'm just hurting myself. You're just, and I think that's a position that a lot of, like, POC creatives are in. That, like, it's it's damaging to be, to be censoring yourself and to be going, oh, yeah, I guess it's okay, or I guess it's the norm, and I guess it's fine. And also, I don't want to be, and if, it, if me speaking out about these issues puts people off from working with me, then they're not people I want to work with. Nah, I think it's going to make the people who do want to work with you want to work with you even more. Like, it's just... I hope so. <laughs> yes, but it's the like, right people. But I think, because also I think it's... I think that it's... What I wanted to ask now is what all the people listening to this podcast, what can they do? We've got, you know, people who are going to the theatre or, you know, choosing what films to watch or what TV shows to watch. People who are making work, people who are programming work, people who are actors looking for work, seeing audition calls. What actions can help this? shitstorm from everybody you know obviously we can say what the Arcola can do not program that work yeah we can say what Henry Nail can do but what can the average Joe or Josephine do well they firstly like the power of boycott is always very strong and we are activists in our daily lives every day in terms of the choices we make about what we see what we do who we give our money to um don't give money to those shows. Don't perpetuate a cycle of, of productions that cast things in the wrong way or cover content inappropriately. Do your research before you see stuff. Look at who the cast is. Check, like you know, because you know, I was like a friend of mine, like naively invited me to an Angel as an Angel. I was like, oh, this looks like it might be something interesting. And I was like, have a check at the cast and let me know what you think. And then she was like, oh, did not see that. And it's yeah. like, don't don't accidentally be a part of a system which perpetuates so much pain. Um, yeah, think about where you're spending your money, think about what you're reading, like, there is so many incredible alternative media forms, um, you know, the tongue is one of them, but there are so many great independent things, just because it's not in a mainstream paper doesn't mean it's not important and mm. valid and interesting, best job podcast, like, yeah. like, I think there's just so many, Galdem, yeah, exactly, Galdem, um, Autostraddle, there's just, there's so many, like, really good, and that doesn't mean that to say that everything that everyone says is always right, but like you can be broadening your mind all the time. Do your own research, do your own reading. Like we're part of a world now where there are like documentaries being churned out every five minutes. Don't just share the latest fifteen minute vice thing. Mm. If you're that interested, like look into it. Go home and like educate yourself and, and arm yourself. Um as an actor, be really critical about the choices you make in terms of what you choose to play. Because yes, you might get paid work for three months, but you also might be switching off a whole host of other venues who do care about representation, a whole host of other directors who care about representation. And I just think, really, really think about what you're doing and what you're doing represents. And I think the moment that we start being that 
that we commit ourselves to the broader cause, however it might hold ourselves back, is an important moment. And I think that that's something that has to be done. Um, there needs to be a broader sense of advocacy um, in terms of what we apply for um, as creatives. Don't see things and be like, I don't think I'm going to get that. Apply for things. People don't apply for things. And I think that's a really important issue. And I think that there's an issue... I mean, this is this is speaking for myself, um, and it's not the same for everyone. But for a lot of POC backgrounds, working in the arts in the first place is a bit of a stigma mm. because a it's not proved to be that successful because you don't get you know like big household names. Mm. I mean, we're starting to get them now. We've got you know Riz Ahmed is like doing mm. a blinder at the moment and the Emmys. Yeah, yeah, which was like a beautiful thing to see, um, but. There is, there's a, like, I know that, like, even with my own family, there's a narrative around, like, what are you doing? <laughs> What's the point? And I think that, I think, you know, allowing those things to be a part of, you know, what you're doing, but also not letting them hold you back, because I think a lot of people don't apply for things. They go, like, oh, I wouldn't get that. It's like, you have to apply for them. You have to be seen. You have to make yourself known. And to speak out, because I think the biggest lesson for me in all of this has been that, so many have got back to me and been like, I saw it and I and I and I felt because I'm not the first person to think this, of course I'm not. Mm. Um, to be like, but people have got back and been like, I saw it, I felt the same, I didn't know what to do, I didn't have the words to say. And the thing is, what's key in everything is advocacy. And I think to not allow yourself to be silenced, because there are so many ways that you don't have to be. You know, we have we do have media and Twitter and everything be able to like have have your two cents and you can you know if like i think i feel like there's a lot of kind of fear from people who are actors directors performers or writers of like oh no if i give if i give something a bad review or call it out in which are different things yeah yeah um as we spoke about but if i do that publicly then it's going to come back to haunt me and i'm not going to get work in this place that place first of all you might be able to do it anonymously yeah. Second of all, if you do do it in your own name, like there are, do you really want to work with that venue again? Exactly. If like exactly. you're saying burning your bridges with the Alcola, and then but then also there's that thing of it's a it's a siren call to all of the other people who agree with you who flock around you. Like I think yeah. has happened to a certain extent with yeah, people definitely. coming to make themselves known to you that you might end up working with someone. Yeah, that would be exactly. awesome. and I, I think... would so much rather go and see something you've made with somebody that you met through this writing this article mm -hmm. than something that you've been kind of had to compromise for to you know working with a venue it's like we want to appeal to white audiences yeah of course like i, I always come back to the same thing like your si like your silence doesn't protect you like it doesn't it doesn't keep you safe it, it, we're not we're not safe as 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 women of color as people of color like we're not we're not safe in this industry we have to we have to support each other also have to feel supported and I think you know in terms of for like white creatives that are wanting to open dialogue just sit back listen like listen to what's being said before you say what you need to say because granted you've got your own side of the argument too but like listen 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 and also don't be afraid to just be like I didn't realize that this was I didn't realize I made this mistake I didn't realize this mistake would have this big ramification I'm going to change. I think being able to be open about that and, and push the dialogue forward is because like we're all learning. We're all, we're all doing this all the time. But I think the situation I have is that, you know, for example, with a piece, people were like, I don't get it. I don't get what you're saying. It's like, what don't you get? It's there. You don't want to get it because you don't want to. And, and at the end of the day, it's like my family didn't come here for this shit. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. do you know what I, mean? I don't think like my nan came, you know, fled, uh, you know, like a cypress that was crum crumbling in order for, for white women on Twitter to be <laughs> to be like sending DMs to her granddaughter being like, eh, you're a racist. <laughs> it's like <laughs> Well, I'd I mean I think also like um white people who do notice it can message that white people are getting it wrong mm. and take on that thing you're saying about people of colour keeping themselves safe. Yeah. It's really important if you're a white person and you notice a casting like this or you know you know, you get put up for a role that you feel like it's not appropriate mm. to put your head over the parapet and say, I'm not going to go for this because, and direct, you know, and also and send an email to the person in charge and say, look, I think what you're doing yeah. is not appropriate. 
yeah. and there are, I can give you the name of ten actors who would be more appropriate also, than me. Also, I mean this genuinely now. <laughs> what 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 trouble would this get me into? But if you if you see if you are a POC but you feel like particularly vulnerable, or just anyone, and you feel like particularly vulnerable and you don't want to speak about out about something. Contact someone who will. Contact mm. me. Send me an email. Contact me. Yeah. I'll like, always I'm, send an email. I'll, like, you can put my details at the end of it. Like, that's absolutely fine. Like, drop, tweet me. Like, say hi to me. And, I, and I'll do it. Because I understand that that energy... And I understand because I think it's an energy that I have more in recent years than I have beforehand. I guess I think it, it starts to pile up and you're like, oh, God, I've got really, like, fucking got to say something now. But I think that, you know, yeah, like, get in touch with people who will talk to you. And who will and who will back you up and so that you don't feel alone because the issue here is isolation it's loneliness like the summation of where we're at that there is no there, that people are so incensed by rhetoric around around people from other countries that they will just be like no it's wrong and whereas before I'd be like we need to understand racists and now I'm like fucking boycott them shut them up make them feel ashamed because they need to know that it's a punishable offence. To be a racist, because at the moment it's a punishable offence to be a person of colour, and I feel like I'm being punished all the time for different things, and the things that people have said to me and to my peers, and the experiences that people have had are just so dark and inappropriate and unfathomable, given the fact it's 2017, that it is a matter of life and death, and I think that people need to either talk to people who are going to talk for them or themselves speak up. Talk to someone who will. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That's great. Um, finally, yes. hashtag feminist faves, yep. who do you want our listeners to go out and read, watch, listen to? Um, You've already mentioned a few. Yeah, I'll, I'll slip them in. Um, watch Crazy Ex-Girlfriend Yeah, cause, uh, by Rachel Bloom, which is a Netflix series, because it's really, really fun and really, like, silly, and also it it's just diverse about making as much as I hate that word but if there's like a, there's, you know there's, there's, there's so many different ranges of like gender sexuality ethnicity and it's all done really well and it's done in a way that's like very very like it's a comedy it's fun it's about a girl chasing a boy and it's about all of those things but it's done in like the most versatile diverse way it's not patting yourself on the back for being diverse it just is which for me is the future I dream of where like, like you know like that's my last bit in the in the piece i just want everyone to be able to go for every part because everyone can be everything yeah um in particular like poc need to be given parts that aren't about terror and stuff so i think you know that's so it's a really it's a really good it's a really 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 good it's the first um filipino male lead in wow, a u.s really? sitcom yeah it's got some great things about it but you're watching it and it's just like funny and hilarious um Mona El Tahani is a Egyptian American journalist, and she is a Muslim, but she's like preaching the sexual revolution, and she's got a book called Hymens and Headscarves, and she's like funny and great and really interesting, and she disturbs the narrative. And even following her on Twitter is a total joy. And Dia Khan, um, who runs Sisterhood, and she's a filmmaker. She's amazing. And she kind of, sort of comes in this package in my mind with like Leila Hussein, who I know that others have mentioned. Yeah, that was Fidoth mentioned. Yeah, she's Leila wonderful. Hussain. I think um, that's what I've done. Yeah, all of those people are amazing. Oh, and also um, the women who put together Nasty Woman. Have you read Nasty Woman? No. It's it was put together very quickly in response to Trump's inauguration, and it's just a series of essays about what it is to be a woman. Um, it's called Nasty Women. You can buy it. It's published by Forest Hill Inc. I want to say. Or might be. Um, it's amazing. It's really good. Yeah. So that's what I'd say. Brilliant. Those are my faves. That's a lot to be getting on with. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. It's like such a huge lot of stuff to digest. But <laughs> I think our listeners are going to love it. I hope um, so. Because, I mean, if there is also, if there is something live that they can go to, we'll add that on the description of the podcast because I know you're looking at having some kind of. Yes, panel I, wanted, type I want to organise a panel. Um, I want to do something live. I'm just working out what my resources are they're quite limited but um so yeah if anyone wants to host um <laughs> yeah yeah so we're looking for like spaces and want to have a big discussion and get people in the room together so that we can have like an authentic truthful but like fun conversation it's kind of easy to want to just stick your head in the sand but there's a lot of joy to be had from like connecting and that. being in the same room together i think it's 
you know, it's really exciting all the stuff that happens online with discussion threads and like articles and Twitter storms, but yeah, to yeah. actually sit down face to face with people is exactly. such an important thing to do. Exactly. So I will look forward to that. Cool. Thank you so much, Tits. Thank you for having me That's and thank great. you for reaching out. Yeah, well, if you want to come back again when you've got work to promote, then I'd love to. Please, please do. Yeah. All right, thank you. Cool, thanks. coming to the end of our episode now and I just want to say another thank you to Tuku and as usual we've got just a few more recommendations for you of theatre that's coming up in November. Starting off with the 4th of November at Soho Theatre there are two shows on in one night that are both part of the Soho Rising um, collection of plays that are being produced by new emerging artists at Soho. Uh, of which Yolanda Mercy, remember, Course Life Crisis, is one. Um, what was the thing from the Queens of Sheba? Women are rising. Rising and rising and rising. rising. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, so Yolanda's actually sold out, I think, at Soho, so we can't recommend her again. Woo, uh, woo go Yolanda! Uh, so we've got two other recommendations from the Soho Rising uh, collection, which is uh, Dangerous Woman by Manjeet Mann, which is a story of one woman's struggle to carve her own path in a family of six women based on her own experiences. Uh, so that's Dangerous Woman. And then on the same night, Elsa, which is a show that we wanted to see in Edinburgh but didn't get a chance to, so we're looking forward to this. Not about Frozen, might we just add. Not about Frozen, nothing to do with Disney. Uh, Elsa works in a cafe and eavesdrops on coffee mornings and waitresses. Uh, she uses song and satire. Um, we had really great things about it in Edinburgh. We so. did, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so Elsa and A Dangerous Woman are on the same night, which is my top recommendation for the November 4th, just a pre-bonfire pre -bonfire. night treat. Yeah, Amazing. is treat yourself to both shows, because one's at seven and one's at nine. So yeah. you could probably have one of those pizzas they do in the Soho Theatre bar in between. Do that and then like go catch some fireworks afterwards because that'll yeah. be firework time probably by then. Yeah. Um, if you've got time before then, um, Wings is at the Young Vic until November 4th. I've also been hearing great things about this. It's Juliet Stevenson, who's just an amazing actor. Um, and it's about a woman, uh, she plays a woman suffering from a stroke. And uh, I think it's kind of quite strange and surreal it says she's a fiercely independent aviator and wing walker walker wing walker is that somebody who walks, walks on, the wings. on the wings of planes I see. so it sounds like an interesting character uh, so if you get a chance to go and see that before november 4th at the young vic uh then on november 1st to november 12th uh on uk tour coming to rich mix on the 11th and 12th of november if you're a london based is rachel or her name looks like rachel but R-A-C-H-E-A-L instead of A-E-L or Fori. Um, and it's a one woman show life, modern life as seen through the eyes of a young black woman inspired again by her experiences and it's kind of a mixed bag of poetry music, comedy and dance and it says she's identifying role models and challenging cultural stereotypes I went to see an early version of the show two years ago at WOW Festival and it really stuck with me as being just one of the most funniest physical pieces of comedy. She's got a thousand voices, accents, um, characters from all over the world. Uh, she's Yeah, she's great. And I'm, I think I'm going to bring a feminist friend to see that one as well. Ooh, yeah, Ooh. let's do it. And that's called Portrait. Portrait. Cool. Rachel LaFory. Um Also, I'm sure you've seen the posters for this one everywhere. We have... Let me get this right. Apologia. Mm, not Apologia. Not Apologia, which is the um, Stockard Channing. Is that her name? Her name's Rizzo from Greece. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I could only ever think of her as Rizzo. Um, she's on all the posters on the underground. Um, I'll tell you what the, the copy is from their website. It says, Kristen Miller is a firebrand matriarch and eminent art historian. A birthday gathering should be a cause for celebration, but the cracks in her family relationships are brought to the surface by the recent publication of her memoir. As the evening progresses, questions are asked about the sacrifices she has made and about the price paid by those she loves. I really like the idea of like writing a memoir and potentially dragging all your friends and family in it and then like them having to, like, yeah. them then being like, mate, why did you write? this 
Um, if it is kind of I think, that kind of stuff. I think the idea is that she wrote this memoir and like left half her family out of it, so they weren't even mentioned. Oh, but I haven't seen it yet. But okay. somebody who I know said she like doesn't just doesn't mention that she's got kids or something. Wow. And so her kids so are like, bold. Mom, what are you done? Yeah. Um, so that is at Trafalgar Studios until November the 18th, and that's also a Jamie Lloyd production. Um, he often does really great work. Um, so check that out. We also have Notorious, created and performed by the famous Lauren Barry Holstein, um, which is on at the Barbican and on UK tour. Um, it's already on tour at the moment, but um, it will be on until um, November the 23rd. Um, in this irreverent phenomenon of music, dance and witch bitch ritual, the famous looks at ways in which social media and consumerism have redefined how we relate to the female body, one's true self and public shaming. Plunging into the ghostly underworld of popular culture, seeking, as she puts it, the real me, the pure me, behind this soiled shroud of promiscuity. Um, that so Lauren Barry Holstein is a live artist, American performance artist. So um, we're imagining that one to be quite fun. Um, we also have White by Coco Brown, which will be on our Oval House from November the fifteenth to the twenty fifth. So moving a bit later into the month. Um, which is a show about identity, blending kind of spoken word with uh, vocal looping. Um, it says, join Coco as she considers the concept of mixed race privilege, tries to connect clashing cultures and explores what it means to be mixed in contemporary Britain. What are you when you are always the other? Sounds really great. Coco's White. great. And Coco's great. So she's actually had like a trilogy of shows, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, she's been in residency or um, associate artist at the Oval House, same as Bella Heaston, who was on the podcast previously. And wait, Yolanda as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, big up Oval House. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so she's producing three shows as part of that, um, all with colours as the title, mm -hmm. white, grey and pink. Yeah. And she was on a scratch night with us with um, that I performed in on Saturday and she was amazing so I got to see what her performance style is like and I'm looking forward to seeing what her show is like yay go 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 cool um, we also have No Place Like Hope at the Old Red Line which is November the 7th until the 26th um, which says Anna and Rebecca aren't where they're supposed to be while serving a community punishment order Becca is sent to a hospice to work and meets Anna a ca cancer patient No Place Like Hope shows the beginning of an unlikely friendship through their conversations their need for company and for someone to listen in their honesty towards each other maybe solace can be found um, and this is written by Callum McGowan and was specifically written it says on the website to pass the Bechdel test um, so that's mm. really great that a guy's specifically been like, there's news about the Bechdel test. Had that as his goal. Yeah. But also, I feel like it should be a, you know. It should be easy enough. It sh yeah. It sh <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty low bar. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and then, I'm just going to move this so that I don't make sounds. Um, and moving on to the last two, we've got Motherhood by Libby LeBird. Um, Motherhood is a one-woman verbatim theatre piece exploring the specific emotional and economic issues surrounding single motherhood, primarily from the perspective of working-class mothers living in London today, uh, which sounds really great. Um, I think we need to see more about kind of like motherhood and like single motherhood, mm. uh, especially in like working-class England. So like this is motherhood with two V's, not a T H. Yeah. By the way, for anybody googling it, M U V V A, motherhood. Hood. Yeah, um, so that is on tour and in London from the 3rd of November to the 1st of December. So you've got a while to it's see It's a this. London tour, so she's doing a tour, but they're Around all London, London venues, like different ends of London. I think they're really varying as well. Yeah, different um, yeah. Ven uh, spaces. Um, and finally, one that we really want to um, tell you guys about is one called Contractions, produced by Definitely Theatre. Definitely is spelt D-E-A-F-I-N-I-T-E-L-Y. Um, as in deaf or hard of hearing, uh, which will be on at the New Diorama, which is from the 1st of November to the 29th. Um, and it says, are your employers concerned about your welfare? Do they have a duty of care? Emma thinks so, but when she begins a relationship with colleague Darren, her manager suggests that she might be in breach of her contract. A series of bizarre meetings follow, during which the consequences of Emma's actions take on a disturbing reality. Um, this is a play by Mike Bartlett, which is being put on by Definitely Theatre, who put on shows that are BSL-created. 
So they're in sign language. So they're yeah. British sign language shows with captions or voiceovers for, for hearing, hearing audiences. Yeah, but it's I think it's aimed at BSL users, people who speak BSL as their first language. I think is their target audience, and so the actors are performing in sign language. So obviously, we're not going to have any deaf listeners because it's a podcast. Mm-hmm. We haven't got the money to transcribe it yet, sadly. Um, but if you've got a deaf or hard of hearing friend who uses BSL, it would be an awesome thing to go see. Maybe a hashtag bring up a missed friend opportunity. Yeah, I I think it's it's the first I've heard of this kind of um, theatre company. The, you often have, you know, shows get subtitled or you get an interpreter in for a couple of performances, um, but never I've never seen a play that is in sign language. So yeah, that's our roundup of shows that we will recommend. Obviously, we haven't seen them yet, so please let us know if you see them and you recommend them to us. Yeah, or tell us if they suck. Yeah, that's totally. fine too. If you hate them, let us know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please do. Share your opinions. They're yeah. all valid. Yeah. Um, so don't forget to follow us at Bechdel Theatre on Twitter and hashtag bring a feminist friend if you're taking a friend to go to the theatre to widen that conversation. And um, we shall see you next month. See you next month. Bye. Bye.